All right, I want to welcome our in-studio guests as well as the people, the hundreds of people that are watching live on YouTube to a very special evening with Mr. Johnny Cupcakes. I'm going to give you guys a little quick backstory as to why we're doing this, and then it's going to be a pretty free-form conversation. I think one of my team members will be monitoring comments on YouTube and speaking on your behalf, so if you guys have a comment or a question that's relevant to what we're talking about tonight, I think Mark and the team will let us know what those questions are, but mostly I'm here for you guys, the, the live in-person audience here, and I think there's a lot of things we want to talk about. If you don't know my guest, his name is Johnny Earl, a.k.a. Johnny Cupcakes. I'm going to have him do his introduction in a second, but I can tell you in terms of like what we want to talk about tonight, there's a lot of questions about how you're able to do what you do from a creative level, how you've been able to build up something from nothing and to propel it, the evolution of that company, this apparel brand that you've started called Johnny Cupcakes. And as you scaled and have grown, how do you manage it all? How do you deal with the work-life balance? I think mm. that's going to tie perfectly into what we talked about yes, before the show. Yes. So let's get on with it. Okay, you guys, please help me welcome Johnny Earl. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I love this. I've done these workshops for a really long time. I've not gotten that kind of ovation thank before. You guys. So thank you. I'm a little hurt, you guys. I'm a little hurt. I'm just gonna say it right up front. Johnny, can you for the people who don't know who you are on the internet, I think everybody in the room knows who you are, but on the internet, can you just give us your your quick bio? Yeah. Um so I trick hungry people for a living. I own um a uh, t-shirt brand in a couple uh, retail stores that look and smell like bakeries, but with no food. Um, uh, we display our cupcake-themed t-shirts inside of refrigerators. Uh, we, we package them in pastry boxes when you buy a shirt. Uh, my t-shirt stores uh, smell like frosting. And uh, we create this childlike wonderment uh, through the art of uh, retail, t-shirts, design, experience, marketing, da 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 all that stuff. And uh, it makes us feel like kids again, and it makes our customers feel like kids again. And I think, um, for me, that's the, the key ingredient. And when I started this, it was never a marketing idea. I just really, uh, I've just always wanted to be a dad, and I've always wanted to be uh, Santa Claus and Willy Wonka. And with this t-shirt brand, it acts as that canvas to have fun and make complete strangers either smile or be very upset and give me a bad review on those food <laughs> websites. Um, which is totally okay, because the upset people talk about us more than anyone else, and we spend little to no money on traditional advertising because of that. But, um, but yes, so that's what I do. I've been doing it for 18 plus years. We do not wholesale unless it's a special project. We sell direct to our customers. We've sold millions of t-shirts uh, direct to our customers in a lot of unordinary ways, whether it might be me jumping out of a coffin, um, out of a hearse at nighttime to sell a spooky themed t-shirt, or selling shirts out of suitcases in different cities or different countries. Uh, so yeah, it's just, just being playful with work and trying to turn it into a business too without losing that sense of wonderment and, and having that balance. Um, What's fascinating to me also is your creativity, your playfulness, your wit, and all of this with one semester of music education in college and then you're like out, right? Yeah, I, I've, listen, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not uh, here to, I'm not, uh, I think someone called me. No a, refunds. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think someone called me a mogul once. I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I thought it was some type of mole that, you know, lives inside of people's butts. I don't know. It's, I don't know what it was. Uh, but I am not that. I, I am a, um, I'm just a little guy with a beard with some ideas. And um, I've, I've never studied business or marketing or design or, or you know, I, I have a hard time sitting still. I had a hard time reading in school. I got put into a charter school. So it, it basically, if I can do this with something as weird as cupcakes on t-shirts, I think everyone can come up with a really cool idea and have that follow through and that balance. And, you know, I still don't have it figured out. I, I, I screw up every day, but I, I'm positive about it. And I look at failures as experiments and experimenting is how we grow. So I, I try to just keep my chin up and, and keep going. Um, I tried out college. It wasn't for me. Uh, I went to school for recording bands, and I was also in a hardcore metal band. And we got signed to a very small record label. Uh, it was a band called On Broken Wings. 
Um, we got banned from a lot of venues because uh, we incited a lot of moshing and uh, uh, I ended up leaving the band at some point to take a risk with the t-shirts and uh, I, I, I wanted to focus on one thing. I didn't want to half step um, both of those things. So, uh, But when I was in school, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you're 18 years old and this is just a thing that we think we need to do and, and you do and you, and you do learn a lot from it. But it was a weird time for me because I was uh, struggling with focusing. I didn't live, there wasn't a campus at this school. It, I, I commuted and my mom was really supportive. She said, school's not going anywhere. If you wanna take a, a break, you can always go back if you need to. But I was touring and being in a band and l doing everything that the books were teaching. So I said, I'm just gonna go do this and I did. And, and um, yeah, so I never studied anything. I still don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing it. I, everything that I know is based off of doing and trying and experimenting. Um, I, I, we've been in business for 18 years, and um, you know it's been a roller coaster. There's been ups and downs, and, and there's been puking on the roller coaster, and uh, a lot of times I'm too short to ride the roller coaster, but uh, I stand on my tippy toes and get on people's backs, and, and with the help and with collaboration. Um, you know, it's not just me. I have a, a small team, and, and we do a lot of collaborating, and, and we, we try to make it try to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also want to set this up in case you guys start thinking about this. As soon as we give you enough of what's going on in Johnny's philosophy, his, his marketing prowess, the things that he's done in his story, I want to give you guys the opportunity to kind of answer or have Johnny answer the question, what would Johnny do? So you have a business problem, a marketing problem, a creative problem, a culture problem, a product issue. Think about it now, so I'm prompting you now to think about it, and then we're gonna turn this, this segment into what would Johnny do? And that is an offshoot of something that's happened more recently in your life, right? Yeah, yeah, so uh, as my brand has grown, um, you know, I, I do other things outside of my brand. Uh, about 13 years ago when I was building out my Boston shop, uh, there was a professor that came in, and he said, what is this? And and you need to come speak to my students. And I was so nervous and I said no and I eventually did it. I wore extra deodorant, I was stuttering and it was the worst experience of my life. People wrote me really nice emails and people were inspired and, and before I knew it more schools and companies were asking me to come out and, and the brand was a case study in several business books and, and required reading at, at some of these schools. Uh, so. At first, I was very excited about this because I was getting free press, and that was cool. There's even some speakers out there that share the Johnny Cupcake story, which is great. I'm getting free press. So uh, as I grew, I realized that these people are getting paid to talk about what I do, and it felt really... Um, it's that feeling when some... If you've ever been cheated on, it's a really bad feeling, and it's kind of like that queasy feeling like, ah... Oh, this is cool, but I, yeah, that's great. I want to do this, but I don't know. So anyways, I decided to go out myself and share my own story, my own experience, my million dollar mistakes, my million dollar ideas, and to help other people. So um, over the past 12 years, I, I, I speak at um, uh, high schools. I, I donate my time for free, and, and I speak about entrepreneurship. And, and I, uh, if, it's a, if it's like a public school, um, or a, a, a school that has some students struggling. I, I try to make time for that. I'll talk a little bit more about my uh, drug and alcohol free lifestyle. I've never tried drinking or drugs. I've always been getting high off of life uh, through um, hanging out with goofy people or performing magic while my friends are getting high. I love the smell of marijuana. It reminds me of a lot of people in my life, but um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm having fun without it and saving a little bit of extra money that lets me do a little bit of extra things to bring my brand to a little extra places. Um, so yeah, over the years I've been in speaking and helping other people with their brands and their companies. Um, sometimes it's a corporate company, sometimes it's a multi-billion dollar company, sometimes it's a festival. Um, sometimes it's just an office that wants to inspire their team so someone will reach out and I'll go in and, and spend um, a few hours with them. So uh, at first I was doing that and just doing it and, and because I love to do it and I wanna share these stories. And then over time, I realized two things. Um, one, I realized other people who were not doing it 
were getting paid to talk about what I do. So I said, okay, maybe I should charge for this. And the second thing is I realized that my time is valuable because when I am not at home or not with my business, there are ideas that are not growing or there's seeds for ideas that are not being planted. And I'm also not, might not be taking care of my health as much or seeing my family as much. And, and that is something that you need to realize. So with your business, uh, whatever it is that you may be doing, um, when you're coming up with a price for your product or your service, um, I failed at this in the beginning when I was pricing out my shirts uh, to, to charge people, but my, ch my shirts and my service for public speaking and creative consulting, um, all of you have a worth and you all have ideas and you all have a story and you all have time that you put into your craft. So make sure you buffer in um, some of that when you're pricing out your product or your skill set. So I do uh, speaking engagements. I get invited to talk 300, uh, to 300 events or companies a year, and I accept 70 of them. Um, however, I am um, transitioning into being a dad. I'm very excited. Um, my wife and I um, are adopting, and we just got matched with twin girls, and we, uh, we can't wait. So, yeah. So, Thank you, thank you. I, I've always wanted to be a dad, and as I mentioned, I, I've been the Santa Claus or Willy Wonka of t-shirts, and I am excited to do that in real life with little humans. Um, what's really beautiful about it, uh, not to get too um, you know, teary-eyed, but um, it's we're adopting through the same agency and country where my wife and her twin sister were adopted through when they were babies. And we bought a home with my wife's twin sister and her husband and their little boy. We're going to raise our kids together. So we're, we're creating this support system at home. And I'm, I'm trying to create that support system with work. So uh, in the office, I have a, an amazing team. I would not be here without them. I would not be here without anybody that we work with inside, outside of the brand. Because it's just me. I, ca I can't do everything myself. We have a well-oiled machine right now. We release new shirts every week, uh, sometimes twice a week. We don't wholesale to stores, so we release our t-shirt designs in small batches at a higher price point, and when we sell out of a shirt, we never make it again. We might make 30 t-shirts, we might make 300, but usually it's right in the middle. Um, we have a few designs that we always keep around, like our classic logos, our mascot, a few slogans. Uh, but for the most part, we want to discontinue them. We have a customer in Belgium named Anne Mays who owns over 1,000 Johnny Cupcake shirts. Wow. And uh, some people have met their best friends. They're significant others through the brand. So I might start a company called Tea Harmony. Um, uh, <laughs> so you could meet your loved one uh, you know, through T-shirts. So I'm trying to find a work-life balance, as we all are. And um, I, I'm so, so thankful about this um, team that I have at the office. Um, things just happen. There was a point in my life where I did have to hit the reset button a few times. There's been times where we've made millions of dollars uh, in one year. But there's been times where it's cost millions of dollars to make millions of dollars. So at the end of the day, the profit is not that much. Um, as I was the early stages of my brand, I just wanted to make fun shirts and do fun things. And I, I was not thinking of the cost and the value of my time and all of these little things that can creep up. And, um, and you know, there's been great years, there's been bad years. However, as I mentioned uh, when we were chatting earlier, sometimes a, a $20,000 mistake or a $100,000 mistake will inspire a million dollar idea and, or a lifestyle change that makes work feel so breathable. And um, we were able to uh, hit the reset button and with less employees be 10 times as productive and make work fun again, um, which, you know, it was, it's always been fun, but, you know, there was a time where I had all these stores and all these employees, and it was great. It was all I ever wanted to do. I, I, had, I wanted to have a store in London, and I had a store there for four years in Los Angeles, and I knew nothing about international business, and I never, um, I didn't know anything about negotiating. 
So I didn't, whatever price they gave me, I took it and I realized I was paying a lot more than most people in the neighborhood, but we made the best out of it. We built a great culture around the brand, got millions of dollars in free press, free advertising, free marketing. We had a few music videos filmed in the store. But as my brand and my life has transitioned, uh, for me getting married, me just wanting to be home, I, I don't want to, I love traveling and meeting all these wonderful people and eating cool food, but if I don't have someone by my side on these trips to share these memories with, it just, um, it just doesn't feel, I don't know, it just doesn't feel as fulfilling as it could be. Um, so at home, we're building our village, our base, and, and it, it's wonderful. We've been doing that for a while. And with business, um, the Johnny Cupcakes brand has been flowing and doing its thing, and it's great. We release shirts once or twice a week, small batches. When they're gone, that's it. And then we also do custom merch. So um, throughout the week, we'll have several companies contact us that want to get a Johnny Cupcakes-themed company T-shirt made. And we'll handle all the design, the production, uh, some of the concepting. And we will create special edition merchandise for them that they will then give out to their employees. So whether it be corporate gifting or an, uh, special shirts for an event that you get when you buy a ticket, um, that's been keeping us busy. It could be 100 t-shirts for, you know, Sue and Joe's lawnmower business, which is really cute and fun. Or it could be several thousands of t-shirts for a really big company or a really big event. Um, so we have that part of the business, we've got the regular part of the business, we do our Johnny Cupcakes pop-up shops, um, big ones in different cities and countries, and then we also do a variety of different types of pop-up shops through our cake dealer program. So uh, we teach entrepreneurship and event planning um, to a very small, um, selected, lovable group of people um, that represent the brand well, and we give them... Uh, a very fair percentage of whatever they make and they are just a part of our extended family and if they want to work hard and create something big th they get paid for what they work so we have different scales of that and, and different ways that they can earn extra bonuses so that's another little part of the business um, forgive me for you know I'm, I'm taking a bunch notes, man. Of and um, the speaking I, as I mentioned I, I get invited to speak 300 times a year. I accept 70 of those. Um, I try to do as many free ones as I can for the places that, that are transparent and just can't afford it, whether it be you know, a high school or a charity event. But then there's some corporate speaking engagements and, and um, you know, I don't usually talk about this, but I'm, I'm just gonna be very transparent in case it inspires you to share your skill set or your story, but um, you know, I've been getting paid uh, $25,000 to speak for 60 minutes or less. Um, and that's my fee for places that get me home in time the same day because I eventually want to, you know, be pr a present dad and, and tuck in my girls at night. Um, if it's out of state, I charge uh, $30,000. And if it's out of country, um, you know, it's a little bit more than that. But at this point, I, I really want to focus on um, Boston, New York City, D.C., Virginia, um, Philly, Chicago, um, even some places out west if it is an event that um, warrants a trip out here. But I'm trying to be very intentional with my time, and I just, I just want to be a good dad when this, this all happens. And, and I like being home. Um, this was all very fun, and it still is, but over the years... You know, getting stranded at airports or getting sick or, or having to eat almonds for dinner from Hudson News or um, just being away from family. Um, and, and not to get even more transparent or teary-eyed, but uh, my mom was in, in an accident um, uh, in October. Uh, she was in Barbados and her and her friend were crossing on a crosswalk. A car stopped, uh, another car whipped around, struck the both of them. My mom's friend died on the scene. Uh, my mom was in a coma for several months. We didn't recognize her when we went over to, to try to get her med flight at home. And um, we didn't think we were going to get our mom back. And instantly, um, even though I'm very thankful to be able to work with my family um, and see my mom more than a lot of people see their moms, instantly 
I would have done anything to take getting extra five minutes, hour of my life back to spend more time with her. So if someone were to offer me a million dollars to go to Australia to speak for a week or do creative consulting, I'm, I would say no. And I have said no to some talks. I, I had a, um, you know, again, I don't usually talk about this stuff, so uh, um, bear with me, but I, I had a few really, the biggest opportunities I've ever had in my life, but I had to say no because I didn't want to be away from my family and, and be away that long. I just like these quick trips. And I have a habit of, of say, oh, I'm going to California. Maybe I should stay for an extra day. Maybe I'll call you and we'll do an interview. Uh, maybe I'll do a pop-up shop here and I'll do a, a speaking engagement here. And maybe I'll buy ice cream for all of my customers that show up at this location with their t-shirts on. And, and, and it's great and it's fun, but I, I, I just, I love being home now. And, and, and I, I want to play more ping pong. I want to take care of my health. Once we got matched with our, our girls, I... I started waking up at five in the morning and running. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm wearing. I am just going. And if I could, if I could get an extra five minutes or an extra day of my life with these these girls, um, I'm going to do it. So I, I just really want to take care of my health. And and there's that. So um, the speaking has been great. That that's you know I almost went to the bathroom in my pants when I started, you know, putting out some of these prices. But at first I was doing it for free and then at eventually charging $500 or being so excited to get a free trip somewhere. But then I was learning that, again, people were, people were sharing my story and getting paid way more than me. And I'm like, what is going on? So I eventually learned my worth and, and um, in that space, in that world. Um, I've inspired some companies to come up with, with some really big ideas, some big campaigns or products. Um, you know, they, consultants charge a lot more than that, and I kind of go in as a, a fraction of the price and get the whole team excited to um, problem solve and with Johnny Cupcake's vision. Um, the other big thing that we're doing is um, a little bit of creative consulting, and I, I really don't like that word creative consulting or the word consulting because you think of, I don't know, it just sounds like, it just sounds like a scary hospital. It sounds like a, it sounds like someone's, I don't know, it doesn't sound good. Something about the word consult, maybe salt, maybe sulk, maybe, I don't know what it is. But anyhow, I'm, I'm just an idea person, so I do a thing called What Would Johnny Do? And I'll go into another person's company or organization, and I'll walk around and I'll pretend that it's mine. And I'll, I'll give them a laundry list of ideas. There might be some million dollar ideas in there. There might be some, you know, five hundred, five thousand dollar ideas in there. It's really up to them. But they're just paying me for my time and my vision. And I was sharing this with you earlier too. So I, I got peer, paired up with um, a speaking engagement for the LASIK eye surgery industry. I know nothing about LASIK eye surgery. I didn't know what it was. Thankfully, it's lasers in your eyes to get better vision, which is a good thing and it gives people better vision but it sounds so scary so i got invited to speak at this event and it was a, i was a little nervous i know nothing about, about the industry yeah yeah so i i went in and i was like what okay they deal with people they want more customers they want more engagement they want more loyalty they want better culture um, they want to have more fun and grow their patient volume so I did the talk for the event for all different companies, and it was wonderful. There was a standard ovation. Again, I almost went to the bathroom in my pants because I couldn't believe, you know. But they, they really took that advice to heart. One company from that invited me to go speak at their headquarters, and they also invited me to, um, to do a What Would Johnny Do creative consulting where I went in their office and gave them ideas. So I walk in. You know, there's all different rooms, but the, you know, the entrance looks like this room here. And I said, all right, if I was getting surgery on my eyes, I would definitely not want fluorescent lighting in here because it feels like a scary hospital. I would want warm colors. I'd want artwork on the walls. I'd want some rugs in different places. I want to feel like I'm going to someone's home. I'd want testimonials on the wall from people from all walks of life, five-year-olds to 95-year-olds, athletes, because the more people that they can show that they've had success with their surgery with, the more comfortable all these different types of people would be. 
Um, I said you should have photos of your customers. You should give out ice cream, maybe pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream or Jenny's ice cream. If, if uh, somebody gets the surgery, it would just be a funny cold treat. And people love to take Instagram photos of their ice cream. And there would be so many people tagging your LASIK eye surgery center if you gave out something unique that you don't normally see. And then one thing I did, they, they give out glasses. I guess you have to wear these protection glasses for a certain amount of time after you get the surgery done. And uh, I, I drew up a, an idea for their packaging and gave it to them. And they, they sent me a text message uh, about three months later. And they said, thank you so much, Johnny. Um, we, your idea led us to win a gold level Addy Award for our packaging. Again, I almost went to the bathroom in my pants, couldn't believe it. And it was just, it was very rewarding to know that all of my uh, mistakes and sleepless nights and puking and sadness and, you know, um, just the bad parts of building a business is still valuable to other people. It's even more valuable than the success because people want to learn from your mistakes. Um, so that, that went great, and um, you know, sometimes I do um, Skype calls, which is a one, one thing I really want to do more of as I transition to being dad. I get to wear sweatpants and then put on like a dress shirt, and nobody knows what's going on down there, which sounds a little creepy, but you know, just sweatpants. It sure does sound creepy. It, you know, it's like, ah. Eh. So I've done a few of those. Um, you know, at first I charged $777.77 just because I thought it sounded like a cool slot machine. And then I started feeling out what other people charge and, again, feeling out my worth and how many ideas I've given these people and getting feedback of what they did with those ideas. Um, so I recently did one for $2,500, um, did a an Skype hour. with them for 60 minutes. Yeah, it's an hour-long coaching call he does. Yep. Right? Yep. So it's an hour-long coaching call. They can tell me all their problems or what they want to do. I will share with them things that I've never shared with anybody or, or you know, just a, a miniature version of what would Johnny do. And I enjoy that because I get to go on someone else's playground and do things with this obscure vision. It's kind of like when you go to a friend's house and it's easier to clean up someone else's mess than your own sometimes. It's fun. You're like, oh, you should do this and you should paint your walls and, and let's, go to, you know, let's go to Ikea and buy a few things. And um, It's kind of like that, but with ideas. But then there's some big projects um, that could be anywhere from you know, um, $250,000 to um, just shy of a million dollars. Um, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, I've never done projects that big, but um, I let people know how much time I could give them. I learn how much they want me involved with their projects. And some of these could be, a, you know, a month or two months or three months. Um, so when you break it down, you know, maybe, maybe I should have charged more. Maybe I should have said no because it's pulling me away from other things. So as you do, because this is, this is what, you know, your company does too, um, you get some big opportunities. And, and a lot of times you have to learn to say no because you don't want to sacrifice your vision and, and, and you seem like a sensitive person. I'm sensitive. I cried when I saw the Titanic when I was like 10 years old. Um, so when you put your heart into someone else's business, you really put your heart into it. And it, again, it's taken you away from other things in life. And you have to put a price on that at some point. And some things are priceless. Uh, so it is good to say no. So all in all, uh, the Johnny Cupcakes brand has turned from a joke to uh, an umbrella of different types of businesses. But they're all my passion projects. And they're all things that I'm very, I take very, very personal and very serious. Can we circle back on something that you said? If you can provide us a tangible example when oh in real just in case yeah. i because i got a i got i got some issues up here just in case i lose this with these projects the most the best part about it all is that i get to work with my mom and my sister and some um and we get to work with charities that we never thought we could work with before and it's great it's almost like robin hood you know as we were saying you get to you know do some big stuff for the big the big league and it allows you to do more things with some people that just can't afford to get some extra help. So, yeah. I, I just want to circle back on something you said earlier about 
the mistakes that you've made have turned into very big ideas potentially for yourself or somebody else. Can you give us an, a concrete example of where you felt like, oh, I totally effed up. I cost the company <laughs> $50,000, whatever it is. And yeah, then later yeah. on, it turned into something. Sure. Uh, here's a big one. This is one of my, this is, this might be my biggest gamble. I, when I opened up my store in Los Angeles, I said, all right, I got to make this place a destination spot. I live in Boston. I can't be there every day. And in Los Angeles, people don't like to walk. They'll drive if a place is four or five blocks down. Um, in Boston, people are walking with shorts on in a blizzard, and that's just, it's just like, it's just what they do. So, and and it's, it's spread out differently here. There's a lot of different pockets and neighborhoods. So um, when I was looking for space, uh, well, one mistake is I, I did not negotiate. Um, I believe I was charged $10 a square foot, and I, and I do my square footage in months, so I was charged for 1,000 square feet, um, $10,000 a month for rent. I didn't realize people around me were paying um, $2,000, $3,000 a month for rent for the same exact space. I was in my mid-20s, and I was so excited that I was going to have a store in California that I just didn't, I didn't, I was blinded by everything. I just wanted to open up that shop, and I was so afraid someone else would take that space. You know, Bathing Ape was over here, Kid Robot, um, you know, Paul Frank, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace. Um, you know, after I moved into the neighborhood, all of these stores started leaving, and, you know, it was just when the market crashed, which I don't think affected us too much, but, um, yeah, I... I I should have done more research. I should have asked more business owners what they were paying. At, at that time, I was very nervous to, to ask people those personal questions. But later on in life, I realized when you talk to other business owners and you're very transparent with what you do, it, it feels like therapy. And there's some things that, you know, some of your close buddies just, you can't go get coffee and talk about. You have to talk to someone else that's, that has similar war stories. So if I could go back in time, I would have changed the, 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 I would have been more cautious on the rent. I wanted to build a cool, funky store. I worked with a company that builds a lot of Jeff Koons balloon animal sculptures. Jeff Koons sells his balloon animal sculptures for like, I don't know, millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. But I couldn't find anyone else that could build big, weird things. Anything you see that is, you know, 30 feet tall or higher and colorful and shiny, this company probably made. I love them. They brought my dreams to life. But I, I didn't negotiate. I didn't ask if we could try it in a cheaper way. I just wanted that store open, and, and, I, wanted, and I would have done anything. I didn't want to get money from the bank. I did not want any investors because I felt like it would jeopardize the creative vision of the company. Um, so I gambled my house to get money from the bank to make ovens that don't even cook anything. Okay? Um, my budget originally was $65,000 to build out the shop and to pay for the merchandise and the rent. Um, I ended up spending... Uh, at least $650,000. This is before I was getting paid for these speaking engagements. This is me giving, putting my blood, my, my home, gambling my whole life because I believed in building a retail experience. And I knew, I, I, knew, I, I just knew that if I did that, not only would it make the shop a destination spot, but it would add value to the brand. Now, we had the shop for eight years. Um, as my lease was coming to an end, I was also getting engaged, and I, and I did not want to, I didn't want to manage people anymore. Um, and I, I, you, it used to be fun to sleep on couches or to, to, to crash at friends' places and to hang out in Los Angeles for a month. But something about owning a store and not being there all the time just felt like I was cheating. It didn't felt right because... I, the Johnny Cupcakes brand, I believe, has that magic element because 
we don't sell merchandise. We, we sell memories, and the merchandise is the byproduct. And through selling memories and relationships and community, um, through doing that, the brand has stayed strong and grown over the years. So it was, it was a little tricky, but we made it work over the years. But towards the end, you know, although we were still making a little profit at the end of the year, it there was so much cost. I mean, paying off those ovens over the years, and and um, we still had great events. We had people film music videos in the shop. Um, so we, we received millions of dollars of free press just from the way the store is decorated. So that's where it turned into a value. Um, what is the shop? And you, there's ovens that open and close and shoot steam out at different times, and you have to go through a 13-foot tall giant oven to get to the stock room. There's, there's oven, that, uh, there's, there's a fake stove top with fire that flickers when you check out. And it was a very magical place. So people wanted, it's their jobs to write about cool things. So I spent little to no money on traditional advertising and marketing. And by putting my focus into building unique experiences around the products, the packaging, um, the events, the store decorations, it gets people doing the talking for us. And that's how the brand has always been. We have, and I do believe in advertising and budget and, and um, marketing, but you can do it on a budget. You can get scrappy and you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, so that was my, probably my bigger mistake, but I would not have changed it. I wouldn't change it if I went back because um, we're still using the ovens. They're in Boston, except this time you have to go through the oven to get into the store. Um, and that really makes people feel special. And, and when I went back to Boston, people wanted to write about new things. So we were featured on several news channels and um, different you know, radio stations and podcasts. And, and it's a destination spot. When a family goes to Boston, they have to leave with their Johnny Cupcake shirts. They're going to a Red Sox game. They have to get their shirts. So um, that's a, a, a larger example of, of um, taking a scary risk if you view it a certain way, it could have been done differently, but the way it was done has allowed me to um, get a lot of free marketing. And even if I found some guy named um, Bob Smith that can do this for $10,000 instead of $650,000, um, just being able to say I worked with a company that builds Jeff Koons balloon animal sculptures it makes strangers that don't know or care about the Johnny Cupcakes brand a little bit interested. Like, what, what's this guy going on? I gotta figure this out. And uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's my belief. I, I, that's but that's the, the big scary one and yeah. So the guy made the oven, the giant oven for you? Is that the big sculpture that was made or something The oven, else? all of the ovens, I had like 20 something okay. ovens created. I had them programmed to shoot steam out at different times. I had them programmed, I was so obsessed with this experience that I wanted them to, uh, if you were looking at my wall of ovens, I, I wanted it to be programmed so you could never predict which one would open up next. Nobody knows that, <laughs> nobody cares, <laughs> but I had to do it no matter how much it cost because I just, you know, People have regrets at some things they do in life, and, and I didn't want to have a regret of something I didn't do. And it's always going to be a story. I could always resell stuff or relocate, but I, I, I had to do that. They built out the stove with a fake fire. Um, I even had a, an industrial fan in the window that had a, a metallic logo built into this fan that must have been from the, the early 1900s. Um, but the tiles on the floor, were laid out diagonally, and when you do that, it makes a small space feel larger. It also costs a lot more money because they're diagonal, so when they hit a flat wall, you're getting a lot of waste. Now, when you go in, when you're grocery shopping, if an aisle has smaller tiles, you feel like you're pushing your shopping cart faster than you actually are. You slow down, you naturally look at the food on sale, sweet, blueberry gushers, I'm gonna buy those, da 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 da. So, we had the tiles hand cut into fourths for days because we couldn't get the specific VCT classic vintage retro bakery style tiles in that size. More cost, more money, but it made the space feel larger and 
it's another story to share with other businesses who are designing their shops with retail. So over the years, that could have been a financial mistake, but um, while companies are hiring me for creative consulting, I get to share some of my um, crafty, scrappy, or not so scrappy mistakes or, I or brilliant ideas that, you know, cr that made a big community and, and a big um, buzz around the brand, and it has turned into value, and I am now seeing that in like my, I guess, adulthood of, of my business, yeah. Is that what goes through your mind when you're thinking of an idea or a, a new business or a new thing to do? is will this be something that people talk about? Is this remarkable, something worth remarking about? Back in the day, it wasn't. Or I would say these things as an excuse, almost like a gambler making an excuse to buy another scratch ticket. I'm like, all right, if I make another oven or if I have the entrance be a giant oven, um, this is going to do this. So I do believe in it, but I think when I was younger, um, my imagination and enthusiasm got in the way of a lot of practicality um, but now I do I do when we do make decisions uh, we do have to look at the cost first because I have employees and I want them to grow in the brand and I want them to buy homes and and pay off their student loans and and uh, and I definitely want to um, you know um, have more money to make more cool things or to work with more charities or we a few years back, I created a scholarship for the charter school that I went to as a kid because it completely changed my life. And at the end of the year, every year, uh, an entrepreneur, whether they go to college or not, they get this, this Johnny Cupcake scholarship. So I'm still passionate about growing, but I'm very um, intentional with my decisions. And I am learning to say no um, and, and to be okay with that because my time is the big value, not how many shirts I've sold or how much, and if we beat last year's numbers, that's just a game that, it's a really bad habit to get in that game of keep trying to beat this and beat that. Like, why not know exactly what you're gonna sell and how much you're gonna make and be okay with that? Think of how much anxiety would be lost if you just breathed and said, all right, I'm okay with making this much or with selling this much. Let's only do this many things. Let's raise our prices because we're limited our shirts and we're not doing as many um, collaborations. You know, so you could think of that too with your products or your service. You know, maybe you do want to be busy and be everywhere and, and grow a bunch, and that is great, and, and it is important to to have those ambitions. But I think when a lot of people talk about hustle, um, they they don't talk about family values and everybody's, you know, wants to go at such a fast pace, which is great and it's important, especially in the beginning stages of building your foundation. But um, I, I, I am a family person and, and, and if you don't have a family, just know you don't have to be blood to be family. So this could be your, your neighbors or your friends um, or your colleagues. And um, I just... You know, it's too bad that sometimes it takes a near-death experience to remind us how valuable um, our time and our happiness is. And, and um, I don't know. Right now in my life, less is more, and I'd rather do less things but make them really big and, and charge a premium price because I, you, just, you just can't pay me enough money to be away from my home for, for a week when, when these girls get here. Um, yeah. So for somebody who isn't in a financial place or creative space where they can have that luxury of choosing to do 100%, less, yep. is there any kind of guideline that you can provide in very real, tangible mm -hmm. terms, like when you might feel like enough is enough? That was a question that came from one of you guys, right? Yeah. He wants to know, like, when is enough enough? Or are we always going to pursue the next bigger goal? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, obviously there was not a time when this happened. I, it, uh, this did, this business didn't happen overnight. The first few years, I mean, the first year or two, I had a day job. I worked at a record shop. Um, and I loved it. And I didn't make much money, but I loved every minute of it. I was around music, around friends, and my happiness was at an all-time high. Um, as the brand was growing, the more time and money I put into the brand, the more I got back. And once I started making a bit more money than my day job, um, I felt comfortable enough to leave my day job and focus on Johnny Cupcakes. And I also felt comfortable to leave my band um, to take a risk with uh, building the Johnny Cupcakes brand. 
Um, so there's a lot of crafty things that you can do when you are starting out or you hit these uh, tricky financial spots and you're just not sure what to do. You might feel like giving up. Um, number one, make more time to go to events like this. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause again for coming out tonight to, to be here. There's people with so many ideas. Uh, there's people that think they can make a lot of money overnight, and sometimes you can, but there's people that think you could just follow and unfollow people on Instagram all day, every day, or say, like, cool photo, I love, I love this. And it's like, I just took a photo, I just took a crappy photo of my salad. You are lying to me, and you are following me for the wrong reasons. In fact, you're not even following me. You're following, oh my God. If I had the time, <laughs> if I had the time on my hands, I, you have no idea how many friends of mine tell me, did you know when I started following you, um, about 67 clothing brands followed and unfollowed me, and they keep doing that until we follow them? Like, if I had the time, I would show up at these doors of these people, and I would just do this and walk away. That's all. There's no need to be nasty or violent. I just want to do this. That's it. When people cut me off in traffic, I don't even get mad anymore. I just go. That's, all that's how need. I kind of felt after last night's Game of Thrones, like I have to say. I'm yeah, like, just, that's okay. It's okay. Just saying. <coughs> okay. So I don't even know what I'm they're talking bots. about. They're right bots. They're yeah. bots. You know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you but but there are some people yeah. who... I see what you're doing, and yeah. it's a big waste of time, and it's a big waste, it's a big waste of time. I have the luxury of starting my brand before there was a thing called social media. There was Facebook, I was at a party, uh, my, one of our friends got into Harvard and it was like the big cool thing, like oh my god, maybe he'll invite us to like one of the Harvard parties, and I went, and I remember the day I was talking to this really cute girl, and she asked me, eventually asked me if I was on Facebook. And when I said no, she just turned her back and walked away. <laughs> and that was it. And I will tell you, she added me on Facebook like three years ago. And we are friends, and I'm not going to say her name. But, um, but anyhow, why the heck did I bring that up? What are we talking about? Um, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I don't know. Social media. Facebook, okay, yeah. So I had the luxury of starting my brand when there wasn't social media. I was also in a heavy metal band. So... I love to grind it out. I love to make flyers. I love to hit the pavement. I have learned about rejection at an early age. So when someone says they don't like my shirts or who's going to buy a stupid shirt with a cupcake on it or when somebody, um, you know, just has something not so cool to say, I can take those punches. And, and I remember there was a time where I had sleepless nights or, you know, um, but you have to use that negativity as motivation to prove those people wrong and to just work a little bit harder. Um, if you are in a tough spot financially and you're building your business, your project, you know, surround yourself with positive people, with creative people here. Um, you're not just going to get value from this chat um, with Chris and I, but um, after this event, I, you should all be trading contacts. You should all be holding each other accountable. Um, and you should be meeting up at coffee shops in real life, and that's where the magic happens, and that's where it happens with customers too. They remember you, and you get to talk about things that you can't just do with a certain amount of characters on Twitter. So I'd say more events, real life events, um, pop-up shops are key. Um, I've done over 500 pop-up shops around the world, 99% of them we have not paid rent for. People have the space, and some people want someone to come in and utilize that space. And they get excited that you might bring people there too, or you might go around and, and it could be a beautiful collaboration where both people are, are having that cross-pollination where everybody's learning about everybody and everyone wins. Um, Pre-orders is a huge thing. It's something we still do. I mean, we are a small brand. We are still scrappy. Um, we are an independent family-run brand. So if we make a few mistakes in one week, we could be in trouble. Um, so... I will say, you know, uh, pre-orders are great. Um, you, we do a lot of reactive marketing, so there might be something on the news or, or something special going on in pop culture. We try to make something within 24 hours, and sometimes we'll do a pre-order. So we strike while the iron's hot, 
And we will say, to make the pre-order feel a little bit more exciting, we'll say it's baked to order. So we add that culinary pun. People are like, ha, 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 cool, baked to order. Uh, sometimes you'll get a free sticker or you'll get you know, something to, by placing a pre-order. Or you're guaranteed a shirt because we're only making them for 24 hours. We're only accepting pre-orders. And it lights a fire. It puts you know, alligators underneath people and it gets them motivated to, to not wait. You know, there are people that will say, hey, that looks cool. I mean, even now, there's times where I get, you know, a few thousand likes on a shirt I might post on Instagram. But there's some times where that equates to like three t-shirt sales. And that's why it's important to have all these other side hustles and to do pop-up shops in real life. Um, there's times where we sell out of shirts in five minutes and people say they, they're going to light themselves on fire on, on social media. And I don't know if it's real or not, so I just try not to, you know, look too into it and say, keep positive, do more what makes you happy, unless lighting yourself on fire makes you happy. Um, so I try to have all these things going on. And that's why I spoke about that umbrella of things that I'm doing with my brand. You might not be doing that now. You might be doing more than that, or you might be doing significantly less or around the same, but... I only mention that because I want you to know that you, as my mom always says, you know, don't put your, all your eggs in one basket. And, um, and it's great when you start to realize you don't just have to depend on online sales. You can go to farmer's markets. You can go to tattoo shops. You can go to festivals. You could, you know, hang out at one of your friend's businesses. Um, there's other ways to sell your products or your service. Now, if you don't have um, as many customers as you'd like, one great thing that you can do is offer your service for free to the, the customers and the type of people and places that you want to be involved with your product. Um, so, for example, if you are a photographer and you want to shoot more weddings or you want to shoot more products or you want to do more advertising work because... Advertising work and weddings give you the big, big money so you can have the flexibility to do the fun stuff. Um, go do some photos for free for someone's wedding. And all you need to ask for in return is a testimonial. People are more likely to trust another person's words before they trust what you have to say about how cool you are. Um, do that for everything. Um, you know, there was... Uh, there was a time where I wanted to do more, um, you know, more business with this type of business and that type of business. So we said, you know what, let's, let's try to do a pop-up shop here and let's try to make t-shirts with this brand or um, collaborate in some, some way. Because the more flexibility you can show on your website um, and through social media, people will then realize that, oh my God, he doesn't just shoot weddings. This person also shoots businesses and they do real estate stuff. And, and, and um, yeah, so whatever business you might be in or service, it's great to, to do that. Uh, testimonials attract trust and, and nice words are, are valuable. It's, they're gold nuggets. Every one of you should have a LinkedIn page. I used to think it was, you know, I used to think it was boring and why do people keep inviting me to do this thing? And I don't want to sign into another thing and I'm, I'm going to stick it to social media and I'm going to be present and, you know, and here I am flicking through my phone and, and, and um, but I eventually signed up for LinkedIn and in this part of my business career, it's been very helpful. Um, if you're not too up and up on uh, the day to day on LinkedIn, it's basically Facebook for people who want to do business. And you also don't see um, some nasty posts that you see on Facebook. Occasionally, you'll see someone getting a little tricky on there. But everyone will say, this is LinkedIn, and you can't do this here. But it's a great place. You could find, you know, let's say you have a small company, and you're just doing, you know, you have a little arts and crafts business, and you're having fun with it. Why do I need to be on LinkedIn? It seems a little corporate. Well. You could be on LinkedIn and you can find somebody who 
designs typography and that might make your next logo. You could be on LinkedIn and find somebody that owns an event space that might want you to come in to be a part of a, a big pop-up shop experience they're putting on or a market they're doing. Um, you could find a trademark attorney and ask them some questions while you're growing and protecting your brand. You could find somebody that designs websites and you could shop around at different prices. And you can also connect with anyone you've ever done business with and have that professional relationship on that platform. Platform, but it has been the best, the best, best platform for me with some of my bigger, bigger projects. Obviously, Instagram's great, Twitter, you know, YouTube. I need to get back and utilize YouTube a little bit more. But um, there's also direct mailing, and I don't know if we ever talked much about this, but oh, I, I love, I love this. So direct mail is, you know, you go to your mailbox and you have a bunch of bunch of crap you throw out and you don't want it. But occasionally. You'll get a catalog from someone and you'll say, how the heck did they know that I collect shrunken heads? They just sent me a shrunken head catalog. Or how did they know that, that I love um, tattoo artwork? I'm, I'm getting all these tattoo magazines in the mail. So there's direct mail where you could um, reach out to clients at a very reasonable price. You could reach out to potential customers. And you work with a direct mailing company and you can figure out what you know demographic you want and location. I haven't done that yet, but what I have done is direct mail to my own customers. And I believe that print is powerful. I don't think print is dead. I think uh, good humor and good design um, attract new customers. And I believe that if you send something well designed to the right person, they might check it out. Now. Over the past four years, I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but um, Google, uh, Gmail, launched a promotions tab. And all of a sudden, a lot of businesses who have had grown their email lists over the years, their click rate and their open rate has dramatically shrunk. And it really hurts because you've spent blood, sweat, and tears meeting people and putting in the hard work, and all of a sudden, they're not even seeing your emails. And they don't know you're having these pop-up shops and events. And they don't know what, that you're launching a new, new thing here and there. So what's great is if you sent them physical mail, even if they're going to throw it in the garbage, they're looking at that more than they would digitally. Because they might not even see yours. And if they do, they're clicking through and they've got all these other distractions going on. Now, let's say it costs you 25 cents to send out a postcard through a direct mail program, or to the, the, the list of customers you have now, but you're selling $36 t-shirts, or you're selling, I don't know, 10,000 or a couple hundred thousand dollar uh, creative consulting services, or you're doing photography and you charge, you know, six, 7,000 bucks a, a wedding. Um, you only need to get one person to call you back and, and to, or to, to book you online or to book your service or to buy your product to pay for, um, what, 25 cents goes in a da 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 All depends on what's, what, what price you're charging, but there are fun and old school ways that you can approach your customers with uh, a new twist and a good design and, and humor and a nice message. So uh, to give you an example, uh, we do our Halloween pop-up shops. It's our favorite, we love Halloween, we release spooky shirts. Um, you know, one year, uh, if you didn't tune in to our, our um, interview before, uh, we've made movie titles for movies that don't exist, like Count Spatula. What else can we do? Let's release the shirts at nighttime, so you have to go out in the dark to get a Johnny Cupcakes t-shirt. Um, okay, that's cool. What else can we do to make this special? Let's, let's have a popcorn machine and, and show movies in the windows and let's have our employees dress up like zombies. Okay, that's cool. Well, I, gone, I went as far as renting out a hearse and a coffin from a creepy guy on Craigslist for $220 and I got delivered in a hearse and a coffin. Now, that $220 got me over $100,000 of free advertising because Channel 7 News came and they wanted to find out why a hearse and a coffin is, front, is in front of a bakery that doesn't even sell real food. Now, we did, uh, we also packaged the movie-themed shirts and VHS tapes, so you got a collectible. 
and we had movie trailers on YouTube, which we involved our customers and, and our, um, which built brand loyalty, and we involved our employees, which got them out of the office and, and got them in some bloody rags, and they have this you know, thing that they're proud of and they loved. So I wanted to do some more pop-up shop events, and I wanted to test out this direct mail idea. So I had a, a Halloween pop-up shop a year or two ago in San Francisco, in Irvine, at the Irvine Spectrum, um, and also in New York City. Now, um, my email list, uh, just to be very tra transparent, right now we have, you know, like, I don't know, between 70 and 100,000 um, people who have signed up on our email list. And I have seen the, the click rate and the open rate shrink. It's still higher than, than some other brands. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but man, I really, that really hurt my feelings. So how can I get them to know about these events we have coming up? My wife might be watching and she hates how I <laughs> tell stories. She's like, just get to the punchline, just get to the punchline. But I, I don't want to leave anything out and I'm like reliving these memories as I'm talking. So bear with me. I love you, Katie, if you're watching. Um, anyhow, everyone's like, all right, what's going on? And I, and I keep forgetting you know, what I'm talking about because I have a hard time thinking things. Three pop-up shops. Okay, so the three pop-up shops, I want to do something different. So I sent out direct mail to, uh, to, to people who lived in those locations. Now, although I have the email list, those are people who accepted marketing. I have uh, a quarter of a million to 300,000 people who have ordered from our websites that we have their physical addresses. And it's not illegal to send them physical mail. So, uh, with direct mail. So, um, I didn't want to send everyone on my list uh, uh, advertisement for the events because if I did that, um, I'm sending them to people in other countries, other states. I want to focus on the people in the West Coast and around Boston, New York. So for the, the East Coast, I did New York, uh, Connecticut customers, Rhode Island, New England, Boston. And then for the pop-up shops on the West Coast, I did, uh, uh, I did San Francisco. I mean, I did all of California because you could choose by state. I did all customers that ordered from, I did some people from, from Idaho, um, Salt Lake City area. I did a few people from Vegas. And all in all, it was like, I don't know, between 10 and 20,000 people on the West Coast and, and like 10 and 15,000 people on the Northeast. And when I sent them the direct mail, I said, all right, let's design this flyer, this postcard to, uh, to look like a ticket. So they felt like they had to redeem it and bring it with them. They felt invited to something instead of advertised. Um, they, they felt a sense of community. I, I had the tickets say it, admit five because I wanted someone to feel like they could fill up their car full of friends and go on a little road trip to go to this Johnny Cupcakes Halloween themed pop-up shop. Um, and then last minute I said, all right, I need to figure out a way to generate, auto-generate random Halloween themed prefixes and suffixes to uh, in suffix to uh, to make people smile. So um, instead of uh, sending out a postcard to Rick Garcia, it would say Rick Garcia the Vampire Slayer, and that was just automatically added. We didn't have to type it in a bunch. Now, if Rick Garcia lived at a house um, with a few other people that might have ordered, instead of sending a postcard to Rick Garcia and also to Amanda. Um, I, instead of not wasting two postcards, but I know that they're gonna likely go in that car together to the pop-up shop. So I could save a little bit of money, print less. So if it's going to a family of customers that live at one household, it would say to the ghost-busting Garcia family. <laughs> now, I couldn't believe how many people were just taking photos of advertisement because they were just delighted through that little detail. It wasn't even a design-related detail. It was just, um, I don't know, clever wording and, and being goofy and nostalgic and, and you know. Um, so that was wonderful. Now people came out. I saw customers that I hadn't seen in six years show up at these events. And I saw people show up who, um, who brought their friends who had never been to the, our pop-up shops or our physical store before. I wish I kept those cards so I could tell you exactly what the statistic was. But people wanted to keep those because it was a cute memory for their event. Um, but I will say uh, it was, 
it was more than 75% of the people who came out had those, those tickets, those postcards that I had sent. And I only had to sell X amount of shirts to pay for those campaigns. So there are things that you can do at all stages of your business career to reach out to people in new ways and to collaborate in new ways and to work on a budget. Um, and, and you just have to ask yourself personally, how much do you need? And you know, when I first started, I, I had my phone bill. You know, I toured with my band and I lived with my parents and I loved living with my parents. I didn't feel the need to move out until I was in my mid-20s, but um, my costs were relatively low. So I was able to sell my shirts at a cheaper price point and I didn't feel this sense of anxiety to, to hustle, 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 work, work, work. I could just grow my brand at a, a, a very um, reasonable level and however I wanted to. I got a quick question and then I want to turn it over to you guys so we can do the what would Johnny do um, is that you talk about reactive marketing which yeah, you're yeah. responding to things that are happening really fast yes and I know that you do a lot of parody stuff yeah there was yep, a question yep. earlier about how do you navigate the legal waters of these parody ideas for sure for sure so um, we do reactive marketing on two fronts we do it on um, light light pop culture ideas actually three fronts light pop culture ideas um, where we might make a shirt that has the colors of um, the Lakers because the Lakers are, you know, they're doing well or, you know, rest in peace or, or the Celtics <laughs> are doing well, rest in peace. Warriors are always a safe bet to make like, you know, theme shirts for, um, but we could just do our crossbone logo with yellow and blue or yellow and purple or green and black. So there's ways to, to do, um, reactive marketing and reactive, uh, what would you call it, uh, pro product launches um, by playing it very safe. Then you could do stuff where you might have your own mascot and you're toying around with it, but at the end of the day, you know, you can't confuse a random consumer into thinking that your product is someone else's. If they know it's a Johnny Cupcake shirt, it says Johnny Cupcakes, they're holding a cupcake, and you can only buy it from Johnny Cupcakes, and there's less than 100 made, um, and it's only our customers likely buying those shirts, um, nobody's going to have a hard time or even really want to spend the time and the money and the resources because we only make a, not that many T-shirts. It's not, you know... But we, we tiptoe around it enough to, to make it Johnny Cupcakes. Now, we have done official licensing deals. We've done stuff with Hello Kitty, with Looney Tunes. We've done stuff with, um, with, with uh, the Power Rangers and the Simpsons and uh, Marilyn Monroe's estate. So we've done a lot of official projects, too. And then we do reactive marketing with um, some charities or natural disasters. So there was a big natural disaster in, um, in Texas a, a couple years ago. And we wanted to do something, but within 24 hours, we wanted to come out with a shirt, and we did. We made a Texas Tough shirt with an armadillo on it, and, and we donated 100% of the proceeds to, um, to whatever charities our customers from Texas voted on. Um, so that was great, but with your question with, with, um, you know, with parodies and whatnot, it, it is a roll of the dice sometimes, you know, we, we have um, been in trouble a couple times. Um, cease and desist? I, yeah, we've had a, a couple cease and desist, like Campbell's Soup came after us because we made a shirt that said frosting in a can. Um, Chiquita Bananas came after us because we made like, we instead of like a, their little logo, we had a, you know, like some cupcake character holding cupcakes instead of bananas. There have been some cease and desists where we'll show our trademark attorney and they'll say this is clearly a parody, and we've contested those and, and, and we've won. Um, so, but those problems are very few and far between. We actually had one situation where we did a Joker-themed shirt, and I got a call from Warner Brothers, and they said, how many of these did you make, and where'd you sell them? And, and, and I was like, we only made like 100 or two, not even, and we only sold them, and we don't have any more of them. And, and they were so curious as to why we don't sell to stores. Because they're used to going after people that sell tens or hundreds of thousands of products. Wholesale, through all the malls. Well, 
at the end of the conversation, they were laughing. And they're like, you, you, you're a bakery and you don't sell food and this is great and we want to work with you and, and, and we want you to you know, come down and we want to give you a tour and, and, and we want to do a licensing official thing with you. And that's another moment where I'm almost going to the bathroom in my pants and I'm like, oh my God, this is great. And um, of getting course- Getting sued to a collaboration. That's a fantastic yeah, I, I, salesperson I, And, right and then we did a collaboration with Looney Tunes and we worked with them. Now with a uh, quick sidetrack thing with the Looney Tunes collaboration, we wanted it to be special. So we, we had uh, cartoon cells um, that were given to us with letters of authenticity and you can only get those if you were the first 20 people that showed up at each of our locations. So that inspired brand loyalty, that inspired people to come out, that inspired blogs to write about us. So anytime you're having a special event or a launch, people love giveaways, they love free food, they love free drinks, they love raffles. Um, it, it gives them a reason to, to go out and to, to bring their friends with them and make a day out of it. Um, but, but yeah, that was a, a funny thing that happened with the parody. But for the most part, we you know it's a Johnny Cupcake shirt and it's not gonna confuse someone on the street into thinking they're gonna get something official. Um, yeah. So you said there were three things that you did for parody. Light, pop culture, ideas. Yes. What were the other two again? Um, light pop culture ideas, um, just colors. So that, that's if it's part a of sport light. thing. Oh, is that a different thing? I guess that's super light. That I would consider yeah. pretty light. Um, having our mascots or our um, just maybe adding like, I don't know, I, 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 think, I think Friday's the restaurant has a font that looks similar to the Red Sox font. And I know some people have safely used that font on some shirts. So we could have a shirt that just says Johnny Cupcakes in a similar looking font or colors. Um, and then there's just going with uh, traditional um, licensing. Okay. Or collaborating. So yeah, those those are the the three okay. things. However you want to label them. Okay. So I'm yeah. gonna turn this over to you guys now. What would Johnny do? Yeah, I want to know what what yeah what questions you guys have. If you don't, I'm gonna use that. Yeah, but yeah. You, you I, I should... whether it be okay, your business so card or let's here we go. Do it. Mark, let's do it. Rick Rick's got his hand up first. He's right here. Yeah, you did. You got it up fast, Rick. Okay. Hand, First hand, of all, hand. Rick, I love your gray hair. I think it looks very <laughs> Thanks, very man. nice on you. My grays are coming yeah. in. And um, a little bit ahead of you, but I, <laughs> I like it. I like it. Enough stress. You'll you look like you know what you're doing. I want advice from you. <laughs> um, do I need this thing, or can you hear? Me? Yeah, yeah. If you can hold it really close to your mouth, just so Here it picks go. up for the Here live. Okay. Uh, I was wondering while you were talking, what a um, Johnny from 15 years ago would do right now today, if he had a wicked clever idea but was um, like creatively endowed and cash strapped, you know, as some businesses are. I mean, startups, people want to get their feet on the ground. Yeah. Uh, we're, you know, these are better times now as far as social platforms go. Yep. Uh, you can't take it. I know you have to be selective, but I'll just kick this back to you to see what, if you put yourself in that sort of predicament, sure. what you would do. Yeah, so if there was a 15, uh, if it was Johnny 15 years ago, what would I do now? Um, knowing what I know now, what would I do to, uh, to grow my brand, business, or service with just not too much um, funds for that? Um, as I mentioned, the pre-orders, I, I might even dabble in a, a Kickstarter page. Um, it's a great way to take a very safe financial risk because you're using other people's money. And by the time you go make your product, you're, you're using other people's money. And if it fails, that's okay too because you know you have to go right back to the beginning. You could refund those people um, however you want to roll the dice for that. Um, if, if I had, if it was me 15 years ago, what else would I do? I'd probably collaborate with people a little bit more. You know, if you don't have too much funds, you go halves on a project or an event together. Um, you're both splitting the cost, you're splitting the profit, um, you, you're, you have that cross-pollination. So even if your brand might be small, you could still collaborate with a relatively small brand and make something medium or above medium sized. Um, so I think those are, those are a couple things that, that I would do. Um, and I'd also try to keep my costs low. So I think a few stages of my brand, we grew um, internally a little bit more than we did externally. 
So I might have had employees I just didn't need and I made up jobs that didn't exist just because I felt proud to have them on the team or I wanted them to grow. So I said, cool, you, you can do marketing because let's, yeah, and you know, and I just go with it. And then three years later, I, I realized it was just a terrible mistake and, and I could have hired someone at a lesser price who delivered a lot more because that's just what they know. So I, I'd keep my, my internal costs a bit smaller um, in, in my team until I grew externally. Okay. Rick, was that good or do you have a follow-up? No, no, that, that's good for that. Okay. Uh, can I yeah, yeah, you go ahead. Kick out you have the mic. Okay. Um, I, was, uh, I, I was curious if at the beginning you were doing all your hands-on everything, own silk screening and, and whatnot. Yeah, when... The well, first, obviously design, but did you follow yeah, it all the way through? Yeah, the, so the first year or two, I was, uh, I was designing my shirts on Microsoft Paint. I, I was... Uh, and you know what's funny? The simple shirts always sell more than when you're working with more colors and fabrics and, and having a bunch of different designers working on one thing. Simple always sells. Like, this... You think this was a you know this was on some new technology? Um, simple cells. People people remember that they they love less colors and and the more simple shapes people fall in love with. And I think we create this this false um, pro this false problem in our heads that we need to solve by by doing more and doing more. So yeah, in the beginning I was doing design shipping. Um, I was, uh, I interned at a silkscreen shop when I went to the charter school. One of the requirements to graduate was to have that internship. So I'd go there. If it wasn't silkscreening, I'd be there catching my shirts at the end of the drying belt, packing them up, saving money on shipping, working with a local company, and being able to see my product hands-on and, and make those changes if I needed to. Um, so it was great. But in the beginning, it wasn't 100% Johnny Cupcakes. Um, the brand was still kind of a hobby, so I, I had my day job, I was touring with the band, so I was able to do a little bit of everything and go to the post office, and eventually I was that guy at the post office that nobody wanted to be behind, or I was that guy at the post <laughs> office, you guys are laughing because you know, uh, I was that guy at the post office that used all the supplies and the priority mail labels, and you know, God forbid I had an international order and I had to fill out the customs thing, and so, um, yeah, that, that, that's, that's how it was at the beginning. I, as I grew, I just had to delegate tasks and, and ask for help. When you feel like you're treading water, you either ask for help or you, you tone things back. You don't have to be the biggest brand in the world, you know. I don't need my shirts to be sold in stores around the world. I don't have to open a, a thousand stores. I'm very thankful for what I have. And even if my business shrinks, I am okay as long as I, I don't want to let go the people that work with me. I just want to make enough money to, to, to keep my team with me, to be able to work with the organizations and charities we work with, and to be able to do a few things, like I need my 220 bucks to get my coffin and my hearse from the creepy guy on Craigslist, and then of course enough money to you know, have a home and to have emergency money in case God forbid something happens to my family's health. So I, I, I need that emergency money, um, and I didn't need these things when I first started because I was so young and naive and, and just, you know, rolling with the punches. Cool. A couple more things. Sure. <laughs> okay, one more mic. thing, Rick. I, I You're that the guy at the post office. Yeah, he's got the mic. He's You're the guy at the post I'm just hey, kidding. Hey, Jaden. No, pass no. the mic. Can I love you. Can we get more IS, higher ISO on Rick so we can see him a little bit better? Can you make some adjustments? Rick, keep going. Oh, um... Have you ever been approached about um, patterning, you know, and working with fabrics, yes. wallpaper and such? Um, not working with wallpaper. I'd love to. Uh, when, I, um, when I bought my first home, it was a fixer-upper haunted house. I was obsessed with this company, Flavor Paper. And I ordered wallpaper, and, and it, it, it had little rats behind these um, fire hydrants. And it, it looked elegant. And then when you looked up close, it was really cool. But I would love to do that. I, um, we've done a few, um, not opposite licensing projects, but um, we've done a, we have a great relationship with Suavecito, the pomade company. Um, and what's beautiful about working with them is, now I did wholesale at one point 
to stores, and it was great. I was so excited. People in stores in Japan, Australia, Italy, all over the U.S. and Canada were, were ordering Johnny Cupcake shirts. But at one point, those people stopped paying me on time. Some of them went out of business and didn't pay me at all. The store called Wicked from uh, Telegraph Street in Berkeley, California still owes me $750, and the guy's name's Mike, and he's from Mountain View, California, <laughs> if you know him. <laughs> But, but you moved time, on. You moved on. I obviously. moved on. Right. I don't even remember that. Right. I don't even remember that he weighs 177 <laughs> pounds and has a dark. Uh, uh, his, his hair is a little dark color, and he's got um, he's got clear rimmed glasses, and, and he and he wears a jean jacket. I don't, you know, um, and I don't. I and, and that he's Irish. Um, no, no, no. But seriously, um, in the beginning, it it killed me when people stopped. Uh, you know, paying me on time at all, and all of a sudden my creative energy, and this has happened a few times in my business, all of a sudden my creative energy is spent trying to make more money for the people, the places, and the things that I just didn't need. Um, and what's great about collaborating with other companies, if they already have their products and stores, that they have a great relationship that pay them on time, you could work out a collaboration deal where they give you um, a percentage of the sales uh, each quarter or each month, however you want to structure it. So there's a lot of ways to get crafty with that so you could breathe, you could focus on what you do best without having to be that jack of all trades, which is very fun and very prideful until you take on more life responsibilities and, and have trouble breathing and sleeping at night. That's it. Okay. All right. Uh, just in closing, I want to say I, I like the... Uh, the food reference with everything you're doing. Thank you. Because a friend of mine, a few years ago, he, unfortunately he's not around anymore, I wish he was, but he had a shop um, in Hollywood. Yep. And uh, you could basically go there and do your own silk screening. You oh, would that's rent out great. screens, and it was called Fresh Pressed. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, and that's you know, clever. and he had it done up like a, like a beauty salon. That's cool. You know, See, that's that's all he, you do. He moved into a space that was a beauty salon and just converted it. People love themes. Yeah. I mean, people wait in line for two hours to buy black charcoal soft serve ice cream to take the same photo one and a half million people have already taken. They want that experience. They want something new. And sometimes it doesn't take much. Sometimes all it takes is a little bit of food coloring. Yeah. Or to open up, as you said, open up a silk screen shop in a beauty salon, or to have a T-shirt shop that's set up like a bakery. Um, it 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 doesn't take it doesn't take much to to stand out. It just takes a little bit of time and being goofy and and um, not rushing and, and and crafting that that fun experience. Fantastic. Let's okay. Oh. Okay, Shima. Let's get into Shima. Jaden, help out with the mic. Shima, that's a great name. That's a superhero. <laughs> Slice your throat. I love it. Thank you very much. You, you know got Shima it. then. Also known as Aria in some circles. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to riff off of Rick's question. Yeah. If you were to actually start this company today without knowing what you know now, just totally carte blanche, do you think that Johnny Cupcakes would be uh, as financially successful and make as big an impact on pop culture as it has so far? I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, I know back then I could count on two hands, maybe even one hand, how many t-shirt brands were really out there. I, I, the brands I remember was Paul Frank. Was, uh, there was a brand from California. They still do some cool stuff to die for from Huntington Beach. Um, and I remember because someone from the brand was related or in the band Throwdown, which was a hardcore band that, that um, we really enjoyed and played with a couple times. Um, so uh, I, I, there was obviously less noise. And as we all know, social media is a curse and a blessing. Cool, we can do anything right now. We can register for a domain name. We could, we could get an online shop up, and, and this is great. But, but then what? Everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. So I think now, um, even though there's more resources and it's easier to start a brand, I think it's a little more difficult to maintain a brand. And I think at the end of the day, the people who truly, truly love what they're doing and, and would give blood and, and, and just absolutely 
eat, sleep, and breathe what they do, those will be the people who outrun the people who are starting a brand because you know, their favorite basketball player has a brand or they want to make some extra money to like, you know, get some rims put on their car. So I think that's, you know, if I started it now, I, I would still have the same work ethic and in love, like my parents taught me to pay attention to those details. And my mom used to uh, take me on rides to run errands and 40 minutes into the drive, I'd see a Ferris wheel in the distance. And my mom would lie to me about running errands to make the surprise of bringing me to a carnival feel that much more special. So in turn, and, and my parents would dip, you know, my dad's work boots and baking flour and make footsteps from the, the chimney to the Christmas tree. So they instilled that sense of wonderment and, and excitement and whatever product or food, whatever company I, I would make, it would have that love. And I think at the end of the day, that human element is what separates um, some successful or long-standing brands with brand loyalty from other brands that are just starting for the sake of having a job, which is okay too, but you, you have to put that love into it because people will see right through you and, and, and see your intentions. Thank you, Shima. So I, 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 you have a follow-up, Shima, or is it? Okay, great. Thank you. In, in the interest of trying to get to as many people as yeah, possible, yeah. I'm going to ask and you I, to keep your answers shorter. Yeah, and I know you want to keep this whole thing to two hours, but well, I'm here as, as long as here, all so of you we'll, want, so we'll whatever see. you need. Uh, so what I would like to, to ask whoever wants to say something, I would like to see Johnny solve a problem. I would like to see him solve a marketing, business, creative problem that you guys have because i want to see how this guy responds in real time what if i just so, turned into a really mean person and i said i have a problem i said you're dry and now you're wet and i just walked out the door i just walked out the door okay that that's one solution so i would never do that does somebody have a problem because i want to see how he coaches is that okay and then if we don't yeah, have just, a lot of those then we'll go around back to the room and and, and again I'm, I'm completely transparent we'll keep you on the I three minute shot clock for gotcha. each answer. yeah yeah okay. let's do it who's got a problem they want to solve or what would johnny do shima you okay yeah, yeah you can go yeah. again <laughs> sorry i'm gonna hog the mic but i actually do have an issue i just launched my company crimson and cognac we do design and branding for film and tv and i don't have a website yet mm. and I'm wondering if this were 1995, w how much information would go onto that website? It would probably just be like a little logo, maybe a contact page, mm. and maybe get more information here from email. But today, with everything being so cluttered and everyone competing for you know attention, do you think that it's better to err on the side of giving a lot of information about mm. your company when it's brand new, or err on the side of like let's just be a little bit more enigmatic? Um, wait, wait, before, before you yeah, say anything. I want to know what, what exactly you do and what you want, um, yeah, what I, type I want to hear of clients your problem. you want. You, you just kind of ask them. Oh. Well, for me, it's, it's a problem of like, um, how much info do I put up out there for sure. people? Like, do they need to know everything that I do? Like, I, I do um, currently working on main titles for feature films yep. and working oh, on a new... Oh, that's so badass. That is so cool. So... It's a very, very small pool of people yeah. that, that are doing this. And for me, it's a big business experiment to, mm -hmm. to see what this is like coming from the world of advertising and going into film. Okay. So I'm just wondering, like, it, to, to create a sense of intrigue, is it good to create a sense of intrigue to get clients? Or is it better to just say, this is exactly what I've done, this is where I've come from, and just, like, bear my soul, like, creative portfolio of everything I've ever done? My way is not the right way. <laughs> But based on my experience as a consumer and as a person who's owned a brand for 18 years, being transparent allows people to understand you and what you do. Your brand DNA is your story, and it's something that cannot be replicated by anybody else. If I had to buy a refrigerator from 300 companies that all sell the same refrigerator, if the one company told me they were a family-run business and they showed photos of themselves as a kid with a bad haircut, even though they're doing and charging and selling the same thing as everybody else, I would choose them because I felt a connection and I feel like they're not this soulless corporate thing. I, I, I feel something. So I would share your story. I'd share your, your family. I, I, would have, I would let people know who you are as a person as well as what you do. 
Um, and that way you could kind of marry the two and I think it would get some great results. That's the perfect advice and that uh, value of transparency is like my number one core value. So I really appreciate that you've been sharing your transparency about a company that's so iconic in my mind. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. You're welcome. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Who's got a problem? Well, well done, Shima. Well done, yes, Johnny. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. We can do a lot of these if you guys move at that pace. And if you ever want, I can build off of that. And, and videos tell better stories than photos. So do a video too. Noted. And if you know anyone that can make movie titles for that video, you should hire them because they're awesome. I do hire them. Hey. There we go. All right. Who's got another problem? All right. I have a problem, Johnny. Yes. Just to warm you up. Yes. We're doing more events in this space. Yes. I want to make this a destination. Oh, what do I love I need it. To do? I love it. Give me one sec. Okay. What do you need to do? Yep. I would find out what the legal capacity is in here so that you don't get your events shut down and you don't get fined or put into a little jail cell. I would, um, there's websites uh, that rent out spaces. Um, after this event, I'll give you the exact websites. Um, I have them in my email. But they're websites that rent out spaces for events, for meetings. And there's also other websites, a variety of them, where people list their events. Um, beyond Eventbrite, there's a lot of different listings, local ones, so on and so forth. But on top of your events, you want to have more of your personal events, but you should also host events here too because you have the space. Um, I've had a few brand activations in my store in events where other people will come in and they want to do something because we have a really cool shop and a space on a very prestigious street. So, you know, we'll charge them anywhere from two to $10,000 to use our space for just a couple hours. And we can have it staffed for an additional fee. We could use our register for an additional fee. And we could, um, we could handle the line control and do photos and video for an additional fee. So I'm doing the same thing on a smaller scale because I have a smaller space but in a more popular area. Um, but there's a lot of ways to do that and, and be financially sound um, by other people bringing people here. But for you advertising your own events, I mean, one big thing I do is I would have made sure that everyone here left with an event listing of what's going on for the next two months so that they know they could come back here. And that's going to save you and your team time and money from trying to reach out and advertise and get people back here. I'd also make sure to get, um, I'd try to get everybody's address so you could send a cool invite if you want to try that movie ticket thing. Um, I would, yeah, I think, th I think those things alone would be great. I'd, I'd even have um, food here to sell. I'd try to find a variety of sponsors that want to get in front of the crowds of people you have here. So you could sell tickets cheaper, sell out the space, but your big ticket item are, will be from um, people spending five to $20,000 just to have something in the gift bags that you give out to people for free that those people are really jazzed to have. Let, let me ask you yeah. a slightly different version of the same question you which is it. i don't have magic ovens that people can walk through i don't have the peewee playhouse the you've got a beautiful space okay but, you know like i think about that we don't have a cute theme to build off of where okay you seem to have you know 13 20 i don't know how many years of endless bakery puns that you okay. can play off of and i sit there and i tell my team what's our hearst what's our dracula moment and we don't seem to have that mm. What will we do so that people who make the trip out here, because people fly from all over the world yeah. to be here, like they're like, I made it, I'm here, and all we got is like a quick tour and you're out the yep. door. Well, one, I wouldn't short sell yourself because okay. I was impressed when I walked in. I was impressed with your bathrooms. I was impressed <laughs> that you own the building. <laughs> There's a lot of bathroom stuff going on. Today, I was impressed yes. with the parking. Um, it is a very beautiful space, and you see it every day, and your job is to design cool things for other people. So... Um, I wouldn't short sell, sell yourself there. What is your vampire moment? I mean, you could still, if you want to do more events here, I would definitely have a slightly elevated stage, maybe some more lighting that's, that's you know, up here. I'd have elements that can shift this room around. I'd have walls that are on wheels, similar to an art gallery, so you can have intimate events or bigger events, events where you're displaying other people's artwork or advertisements, again, where you're making that kickback for your events. 
Um, and then what, you, what do you want to call this space? Maybe you come up with a name. Maybe you call it The Hive, and, and you have like a Bumblebee logo, and you have a business card that smells like honey, and you've got some honeycomb elements that are carved out of wood hanging above the bar area, and you, you have a mascot, and you have some merchandise that you're selling or giving away to build awareness for the event space. Um, so I think, you know, I think you could totally have an like offshoot. That. You like that? I do. Okay. Great. Thank you. You got it. All you right. It. Somebody else. Okay. Right up front. Who's got the mic? Yeah. And this no, is just uh, this. No. Yeah. Up, up front right here. There you go. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Jaden. So a couple of questions, but um, yeah. one thing that I think about when you were talking earlier is how you took your retail space and you made it an experience, a place where somebody wants to take photos of, they want to, you know, obviously show off where they're at and really tie into being there in that spot. Yeah. Um, when you're online, you can't necessarily do that, right? So how do you make your online spot the destination? How do you make it something special where people really want to visit, they want to check it out, make sure, you know, e-commerce, right? You want to get people showing up to your site, not necessarily just through PPC and running advertising dollars. Like you want them to come to your site because mm. it's a destination. 100%. So what would Johnny do? And what would John? And what did Johnny do? Because I had this problem, and I still do sometimes. So, uh, yes, I have cool shops, and it's great, and it's easy to have an experience for someone. How do you do that in the digital space, especially with all these distractions? Well, um, one, we have our online packaging be very fun and colorful. It gives people a reason to take photos of their packaging. It makes the product feel more valuable, and it makes it feel like it's your birthday when you get a Johnny Cupcake shirt in the mail. Um, we have our shirts limited edition. We try to have a little bit of humor when we send out our emails so people don't feel like they have to unsubscribe. They're delighted when they get an email from us. Um, again, the limited edition thing really helps. Once in a while, we need to start doing more of this, but we'll have really fun descriptions of the shirts. Every now and then, we'll have shirts where a percentage goes to a different charity. Um, so that draws a connection with some people. Um, having just a, a user-friendly website, like when our website loads, our mascot, the little chubby character, he's running chasing a cupcake. And that little element makes something that you hate, waiting for something to load, it makes you laugh and it makes you show people. Um, so I, I think that's a big thing. Um, I, as I said before, having your story on there to bring value. I used to have a blog that I updated every day, but once uh, Instagram became a little bit more relevant, it was more easier for me to have that two-way dialogue with customers. But it's very easy to send customers to our website and web store from um, Instagram through storytelling right. and building dialogue off of something as simple as a t-shirt. Gotcha. I have one more if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, um, and back on the e-commerce side, yeah. um, one of the things that obviously really cuts into your margins is shipping, right? So like one of the things we always focus on is what, what can we do to get average order value up? What, we, what can we do to get people to buy multiples, mm. to buy you know, different items, things that are order bumps to get our prices up that kind of cut into that a little bit? Mm. Like how do you guys focus on that besides just free shipping, right? Like yeah, everybody's yeah. like hit a threshold, you get free shipping. What yeah, else we do don't do? do free shipping. I know. We don't do free shipping. Yeah, that, um, that $8 shipping yeah, on yeah. shirts is it's impressive. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> what we do is uh, every now and then we'll give away something free. Mm -hmm. Could be a sticker, could be a vintage New Kids on the Block or Ninja Turtles trading card, could be a candy, it could be a doll's head, it could be a $20 bill. The more weird it is, the better chance someone's going to talk about it and share that experience and, and be pumped up. But... Um, um, what did you even ask? I'm like, I was, I'm I was so asking, out of it right now. Say, no, 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 say it good. again, um, just, yeah, just like the short end of it. I'm sorry. Getting up your average order value, right? So getting people yes, to buy multiple got you, got items you. at a single okay. time. So average order value, um, basically we could have um, products, smaller price products. So um, we sell so many stickers, so many pins, keychains. We try to always have those in stock, even though it's small socks, it's a small price item. It's not always, but usually it's a one-size-fits-all. Same with tote bags. So those things have really helped our orders for T-shirts be a little bit higher. But the, the kicker is not even what goes into the order or what people can buy off the website. It's educating your customers that you can also sell something different. So our customers know that they could have their entire company 
order a hundred or a thousand Johnny Cupcake shirts that we would design with them. We'll even package them in a pastry box and we'll even post them on our social media to give them some more love. Um, so we have some big ticket items that we can advertise ourselves into that order and we don't have to stress out about trying to fit as many things physically in that order but we could promote an upcoming event at the Hive, or we could, uh, <laughs> or we could promote an upcoming um, you know, pop-up shop. So having those little things um, have, have helped, but also having the physical little things like pins have definitely helped our orders increase. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Great, You're thanks. You're okay, uh, we'll, we'll, in, in the back. I'll walk out there. I'm good. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I'm from Boston, and Hello. I moved to LA in 2006. And I went to your—you had this kickoff event at the Middle East. Mm. That was like the most original thing. So it's been amazing seeing your journey. Thank you. And um, and it's funny. I worked in the big agency world, and I'll get ideas as if I'm part of this giant company. Oh, hold your mic up a little. Oh, sorry. Closer. You got it. And and then you're so, like. So so you you work in the advertising agency I worked, world? Yeah, I worked in the big ad agency, and I'll get ideas as if I'm part of this big company, and then I'm like, oh, that's right, I'm just me and I don't know how to structure it. So like in the beginning, were you just um, DBA or LLC? And then you mentioned like the trademark attorney, like how soon did you have to get yeah, yeah. that so, side of things going? Yep, is great my... question. So when I first started the Johnny Cupcakes brand, um, it was a, oh, and what is the pro your problem that you're having right now? Is just trying to figure out how to structure your business? Yes, yeah. Well, that's, but just, that might the be a simplest, little bit more. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. but just was the simplest just to like. Sure, sure. So when know, I first started, I did Johnny Earl DBA Johnny Cupcakes clothing. Um, I was able to get a checking account and I got a free toaster. I registered as a business um, with, the, with the town hall, with the city hall. And then I started keeping track of my receipts and having things to write off, which, you know. Um, so I did that for a little bit. And then I nixed the word clothing because it, made, it just cluttered up the name Johnny Cupcakes. I don't know how I feel about clothing brands who add that word clothing or apparel. You don't really need to do that. Have that little, um, tell your story, but also have, you, you don't have to have a super long name. It just makes it a little dif difficult. Um, at one point, as my brand grew tremendously, uh, we decided to be incorporated. Um, I think it helps separate some of the personal purchases from the business. I think it helps like if I were to get sued from like running somebody over, the company can't get sued. Little things like that. Um, so it's really, it's all about what size your company is, what you want to do, but I would suggest um, talking with a, um, I don't know, we could talk more after this, but I, I would want to know a little bit more details about your company to say which one you want to go with. Okay, yeah, and I was just curious, it's the initial, like it's yeah. not, you know, I don't have, a, it's just a, I'm a one person, I'm a one person and see at the moment. And so I just was curious when yeah. you just got, you know. And I used to just beginning. put the word, I used to just put TM next to all of my designs just so nobody would mess with me. But mm -hmm. I didn't even know if it was protected or not. I just couldn't afford it. And I had no idea if it was going to turn into a business. So, right. okay. you know, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Okay, cool. Thank you. You got it. So let's do it up front. Right up here. Raise your hand. You got to make it high so Jaden can see you. Thank you. Yeah. So let's say, okay, this ties in between Simple Cells and your idea with your LA store. So let's say you are starting off your clothing brand and you have shirts that you want to sell. Do you stick with like a really simple shirt and do one or three or do you focus on one and like really emphasize the packaging and make it so that people want to talk about it as soon as you drop your first shirt? Yeah, we, oh, and is there a pro, are you, are you struggling with what to do, just so I can understand? Do well, you... I've got, I have have ideas for shirts, and I have a pop-up yep. gallery happening in June. Okay. But I kind of want to make my first designs, like, memorable. Got you. So you're not sure if you should make many products or focus on one or two, but yeah. have really exciting packaging. Yeah, but then, like, after listening to you, I'm like, oh, maybe I should, like, focus on really crazy packaging yeah, or yeah. making it, like, scented or something in, like that. In my eyes... That's what I would do, mm -hmm. just because right now, everybody or everybody knows someone who has a t-shirt or apparel brand, so I would totally make your shirt more than just a shirt by making that packaging or making scented or glow-in-the-dark ink. 
Now, if you can't, if your budget isn't super, super big, you could get crafty, you could buy cheap boxes off of Uline, you could meet someone on Etsy that does wax seals or that has an embosser. So there's a lot of ways to make your packaging feel prestigious at a, at a very low price. But I would, I would go big or go home with that. Okay. Thank you. You got it. You got it. All right. Who's got another problem? I like how you keep people like, what's your problem? Again? Yeah, well, because I, uh, I, I learned that from you, okay, Chris. Okay, all right. Yeah, I learned that from you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Woody Landeros. I have a video production company, and I'm at the point where I need a team because we've been, we've been charging a little bit more, and we've been getting a lot of work coming in. And I feel like you said... Uh, pretty clear gem in there where you had a large team and you had a lot of things going down and now you're starting to to cut back and have um, certain individuals in there. I guess what I'm trying to ask is um, what, what did you do to be able to grow that grow that team and grow it like the correct way because I feel like I'm doing it the wrong way right now. Yeah, I'm so doing more training and that's, I, I'm getting stuck. <laughs> I got you. So I've been on all different levels with this and my way is in the right way, and at this point in my life, less is more, because I my time is is the my time and my health is is what I'm shooting for right now. But if you want to grow your team, so there was a time where I had um, I had a few designers in house, and it was great. I, I loved that I had this family of people under this roof, and we could chat at lunch break and just all goof around, and it, it just it was perfect. It was a gang, and it was great, and we. We, we did some really big and special things together. Um, however, as a business owner, you know, with me trying to balance my personal life, I, I'm having trouble being in the office all the time because things outside of the office are just as important. So it was difficult for me to be able to manage or micromanage so many people. Um, I had other costs, though. I had to get a bigger office. I, that was an expense. I had to... You know, there were some times where I'm walking around, I'm like, man, that person's on Facebook, and do I, do I make a big deal out of it? They're my friend. I don't want to, ah, and then I bring it home, and then I talk about it with my wife, and then it's just the thing that festers in the house, and, 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 and I have to pay health insurance, and I have to buy an extra parking spot from the landlord, and, and there's all these things that go on that just make it a little bit more tricky. But now, I work with a lot of freelancers. The freelancers get to be stay-at-home dads or moms, and, and the freelancers don't get paid unless the job's done, whereas if I have someone under a roof, they could be messing around doing whatever they want, but they're still getting paid no matter what. Um, also, it's difficult to expect a creative person to work a nine-to-five job under you know harsh lighting and to, you know, it, that was a tough thing for me to realize too, um, but you know, creative people, like sometimes me, I just need to go work at a coffee shop and, and switch up my environment. So I think there's a way that you can grow your business um, and work with other videographers um, without having to, to make this big corporation. You could pack a punch and do things um, by working with freelancers and creating a long distance family where, where you have an, an agreement and you set expectations for one another. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's pass the mic over then. Hi, my name is Peter. Hey, Peter, how you doing? I'm fine, thank you. And um, so my problem is I'm a really energetic and passionate person. That's not the problem, but the problem that stems from it is that I want to try and do everything, mm. right? And yep. so, for example, if I was you, I would maybe want to go into maybe sneakers and then jackets and mm. you already have hats. And then what about trying other things other than doing clothing? and expanding and innovating. And where do you, how do you focus all of that and prioritize what you need to do mm. and without losing all of that energy to keep on growing and trying out new things to keep yeah. things fresh? I, I, I've been there, I'm right there with you and, and I struggle with it every now and then. So um, we all wanna do everything. It's tough, you have to prioritize. You have to see what fulfills you as a human and what is practical. There was a time where I felt like people would think I'm just another t-shirt brand unless I make winter jackets and this and, and all of these other products. And there was a year when I did that. And you know, when you make products um, from scratch and you work with different um, 
factories and different companies where there's a lot more elements involved from buttons and zippers, there's a lot more room for error. You have to pay for that money up front or you pay half up front. And if things get screwed up, it could really derail your business. And it also takes your eyes off of the prize. Like my number one seller is always t-shirts and, and, and there's no digital dressing room. So um, if someone wanted to try on a, a sneaker or a jacket or pants, it, it makes it a little bit tougher to sell online, whereas accessories and shirts sell. But you can, one, collaborate with companies that are already doing these things that people might be familiar with. Um, two, realize that you might, buy, you might not want to buy sushi from a, uh, from a pizza shop. So you'll notice there's some restaurants that try to do everything, or you know, buying seafood from a fast food place just Buying sushi for 50 cents, just, I, yeah, I, c I can't do it. That's a great deal. Even buffets, I know some people that love those, but man, I, I, I see a lot of germs in there. Even gyms. <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time going to the gym. I, fi I think they're filled with germs and perverts. And I just, <laughs> I, I, I would much rather run. I would much rather go run and breathe fresh air outside. But there are ways for gyms to be successful too. So anyways. Um, this is anecdotal. Or is it evidence? Both, both, yeah. I, 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 I think it's anecdotal, but okay, yeah. I don't know. I saw a guy on a treadmill with jeans on walking very slow and just looking at all the women when they come in. And I wanted to clothesline that guy. But you know what I did? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, listen, I've learned less is more. Um, you can, you know... Work your heart out, try all this stuff, and, and if that's what fulfills you, but, but just don't get distracted from what works. And if you have a hard time figuring out how to do something or, or allocating that energy, collaborate with someone that's already doing it. May I um, evolve the question? You may evolve, my little <laughs> butterfly. <laughs> so what about when it comes to, for example, maybe creating content? I'm not, I, I've just discovered your brand, right? I don't know if you You just discovered videos. which? Your brand. Johnny, Johnny oh, Cupcakes. your brand, my yeah. brand, yep, yeah. so okay. So I don't know if you guys are already like making videos, you know, yeah, to create we do content everything. online so and do see, this and do that, a bunch of different forms is, of creation. Um, we don't really like set out to get content made. Like if I'm having a big event, I want to get someone to come and video it, of course, but day to day, like you just have to document your journey. You, you could, you could, people want to hear stories. So. The visual content is very important, but if it doesn't have the context from a story, it, it's missing a really big mark. So if you could marry both of those things, it's great. Um, with us with content, like earlier today, I posted a video of a magic trick I did with uh, um, a customer's grandmother who I stay with when I'm in Los Angeles, and I showed her reaction. And I just wrote, sometimes it's the little things. So sometimes I'll post up a recipe of like Greek cookies that my old Greek babysitters taught us how to make. So content, yeah, could be, could be everything, but the more transparent it is, um, people feel like they're on your journey, they know you, and it's, it's nice to share. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Peter, my butterfly. My, li <laughs> my little butterfly. Uh, who's got the next question? Okay. Oh, right in the where, back Where is there. it? Okay, we're, we we're closing. Okay, Michael Bryce, take us home. Take us home, baby. So I work as a creative director here in Los Angeles, and I've been in a lot of client meetings and pitches where uh, partnering with Johnny Cupcakes has come up as an idea as part of the pitch from the agency. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, and it's always, you know, like agencies are always looking to partner with successful brands and doing those things. But unfortunately, there are always ideas that kind of fall off the, the radar when it comes down to time for sure. um, and money. What is the perfect timeline for you in terms of an agency reaching out or a business you know, reaching out? A specific example, last year I was at Sundance Institute for this year's festival. Yep. And they were in a rush to do apparel Okay, and when you the, say a rush, how many uh, how many days? They were out. About? They were they were, they felt that they were at a, a rush in August. That they okay. were way past their date. Okay. And so so it, it was a, a they had a month to get something together or a couple weeks. 
couple of months, it was different because they okay. have a lot of different, gotcha, gotcha. you know, kind of merch okay. options to so do. So last minute they had a great idea and unfortunately well, we missed the boat. Yeah, this it's year. like how, when, when can companies reach out to you and what's your timeline optimally to kind of connect Michael with does. companies and do these collaborations? Yeah. Well, first of all, Michael, are you asking me on a date? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, so when, when would an agency uh, want to work with me, uh, want to work with us, how much time would we need? So two months is perfect. We could, we could come up with a concept, uh, a t-shirt design or two. Uh, we'd be able to have it manufactured. We could probably get our pastry box packaging out there. And we could even come up with um, some type of marketing campaign or a video or, or even create a storyline to go along with it in two months for sure. And how open are you when the creatives at the agency come to you and have an idea in mind? Is that something where you draw a line where it has to come from your no. entity? Nope, nope. We, we get those ideas all the time. But if they want to make, they, if they want us to do a Johnny Cupcakes product or a collaboration project or shirt, um, we just want to make sure that our elements are in there because that's what our customers are seeking to collect. Um, and that would benefit the, the client. So, um, but the, the, only thing, the only thing that I'd say no to is if it's a company that I don't believe in, if there's just gyms. not as much dive. <laughs> What'd you say? Gyms. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, no potentially, it depends fitness. what gym. If there's people in there with jeans walking slowly on treadmills, I'm gonna have. I, a I didn't have my pants that day. What do you That's want? Right. Well, hey, keep keep your eye on the uh, the treadmill. Uh, so, yeah, we could do it in two months or less. And the only projects that we would turn down is if it's something I personally don't believe in. Um, if it's uh, someone that's. Uh, I don't know, doesn't have as much diversity or was in the news for doing something terrible or things like that. But that's few and far between. Um, we like to have fun and we love to use other people's companies as our playground to create something unique. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. You Thank you, it. Michael. So I, I want to end on a very selfish note, if I may. Yeah, yeah. Because you sure. and I were talking about so many things before everything sure. showed up. And I don't want them to miss out on some of this dialogue, which was... When and you talked about this earlier, when you went out to speak, you realized that there's a value that you're giving and you're you're making sacrifices by saying yes to this. You're saying no to something else. Yeah. And so when an organization says to you, we don't have any money to pay for you to speak. How do you respond to that? What's your tactic on how do you <laughs> over the phone? <laughs> they can't hear that. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's funny. I I've had a few responses. Yeah. I mean. There's been events that ask me to speak, and they say, oh, and, and that we'll have a big talk, and it's an hour long, and, and it sounds like it's about to happen, and then they'll say, they'll ask for my fee, and they'll say, we actually don't pay speakers. Right. Now, it kills me, because there's a lot of events that do this, and I, I, it's nice that they're giving people an opportunity to get exposure, and I have said yes to some of these, but it still made me feel like it, it just it didn't sit well with me. Um, I can tell in five minutes, roughly, how much somebody's making, an event planner's making, or, or a, a company's making that's putting on an event. You, they're selling tickets for $1,200. They have 20 different sponsors, some very big sponsors, like Adobe or this or that. Um, but, and, the, and, and they expect speakers to speak for free. The audience don't know that some of these companies operate this way. And if they knew, I think there would be a really big problem. I've had some companies offer to, um, really big, like billion dollar companies, offer to, uh, to pay me in their product. And I really wanted to say, you know, unfortunately I can't fill up my gas tank with that and my kids don't eat, uh, and this product isn't a food. Uh, my kids don't eat that and, and do you get paid with this by the way? Um, but I, I had to be polite, but I did, I did get a little feisty recently. A very popular social media platform wanted to pay me um, in credit for advertising. <laughs> you were there um, on that platform, and, um, and, and I just, even though I was speaking in front of their whole team, and, the, and, and you know, I w there would have been a teeny bit amount of money, 
it wasn't worth my time, and I, and I felt okay saying no. And I said, you know what, I've worked uh, 18 years to get to where I am with this price, and I know that my price is still priced below market value for similar speakers out there, um, and I'm going to have to decline. But if you change your mind in the future, if your budget changes, um, or if you do want to work with us, um, maybe I could make this work if you donate X amount to this charity that we work with and if you buy um, t-shirts for everybody and take care of my flights and hotel for myself and, and like a family member. So it, it's really up to you how you want to do structure that, but um, you can also use that, that as motivation. People who are pretending they don't have a budget, you can say, okay, I'm going to just throw my own event and I'm going to put a tickets on Eventbrite and, and if people want to come down to the hive, I'm going to sell all these honey related things and I'm going to have merchandise and I'm going to have some, you know, some, some shout outs and some gift bag items. So I've rented out movie theaters in San Francisco and in New York City. Uh, I've rented them out in, in Melbourne, Australia, and I've gathered sponsors and turned it into a very, you know, successful sold out event that was profitable and beneficial for everybody involved. So when someone says they don't have the budget, I just say, okay, I'm just going to make my own event. And maybe I'll make it the same date and right next to yours, you know? <laughs> the, the kicker is when they tell me, oh, but you're going to get exposure, and it's like, we're, you, you compare the social media platforms and the amount of time both events have been in business or both companies, you can clearly see that we are, are sending people to them and sending value to them. And, and it, it's, it's, it's tough at first to say no, though. Because you're like, what if I don't get that opportunity and someone else is going to take that and I could meet all these people, but you have value. Your experience and your history and your work ethic and, and you should not short sell yourself. Um, but if you're at a spot where you do need to get the word out and not everybody knows about you, maybe you can barter with them and figure out a way for everybody to win. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Johnny. Yeah. You guys, thank, please help me. Thank you. Thank Johnny. Thank you. 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 Okay, you guys don't have to go home. I'm going to officially sign off now on our live stream. Okay, Jonah? I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you to all 300 some odd people that are on here. I saw your funny comments, a lot of bathroom jokes. Uh, people saying this is great, very kind of knowledgeable stuff. Thank you. Knowledge thank bombs, you. Gold, golden nuggets being dropped here. So that's it, guys. I'll see you guys next time. Don't and forget you know to like, to comment, me. subscribe. Yep. How do we reach you, Johnny? Uh, at Johnny Cupcakes on everything. And um, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Yeah. We'll put those uh, in the notes below. All Thank right. Thank you, that's everybody. It. Appreciate it.